Um, and it's great to uh, have Andreas Krause from ETH uh, uh, Zurich, uh, where he's a professor of computer science and he leads the learning and adaptive systems group, um, focusing on uh, broadly speaking machine learning and adaptive systems. Um, really excited to have him here today. Andreas uh, really does um, really long, uh, long standing work and he's as, has been recognized by a number of test of time awards, which is I think one of the sort of pinnacles of um, like really, really what we're, we're striving to, you know, work that really, really uh, stands the test of time. So I'm really excited for what he has to share with us today and the future test of time awards <laughs> for, um, for this work. Uh, really excited that he'll be able to share with us some uh, really important, some of the most important challenges in reinforcement learning today uh, having to do with safety. Uh, and that's one of the major challenges before we can actually see this kind of work uh, sort of be, um, be in practice, be put in practice more. So um, I will just make a note that uh, for any of you uh, who are interested, uh, feel, free, uh, feel free to reach out to Andreas or after the talk. We'll also leave the room open uh, after the official end of the talk for maybe, maybe 15 minutes if, you, if anyone has uh, some follow-up questions for Andreas, you know, some, some one of the sort of shortcomings of virtual talks is often that we don't have that kind of more informal time. So we'll, we'll have a few minutes of that after the hour. And without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to Andreas. So oh, <clears throat> thanks so much, Kathy, for the kind words and kind introduction. Thanks a lot to all of you for coming. I understand this is a somewhat different hour than the normal slot for the seminar. Thanks a lot for inviting me. It's always uh, exciting to visit MIT, um, if only virtually this time. Uh, so I'm very happy to tell you about some work that we've been doing on uh, improving safety and efficiency of reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, algorithms. And this is, of course, work with um, a fantastic set of PhD students, postdocs, and senior collaborators, whom I'll acknowledge as we go along. I hope you can all see my screen, uh, otherwise shout out. Also, if there's any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I'm happy to go into more details uh, anytime and to not get through the material. So we'll see how far we get. Okay, so um, given this audience, I don't have to say much about uh, reinforcement learning. Of course, it's this abstract model of an agent embedded in some environment, which it can affect by carrying out some actions, which might cause the environment to change its state and the agent to derive some reward from it. And the trouble is, of course, that the poor agent doesn't know how the world works, that it means it needs to decide whether to explore, experimenting with actions to learn about their consequences, and exploit using what it learned in order to do well. And of course, reinforcement learning has a rich history going back several decades, both in machine learning and also in control theory, in particular in the context of approximate dynamic programming, adaptive control, and so on. So I hope you don't mind if I stay primarily with the RL notation uh, here in this talk. Um, but we'll connect to more control theoretic ideas uh, in later parts of this talk. Uh, now, give, despite this rich history, we've all seen these pretty remarkable improvements in recent years, um, culminating in DeepMind's landmark victory in the game of Go, um, uh, which certainly has been a long-term challenge uh, for uh, AI. Now, given those advances, um, uh, there certainly has been an increased appetite in applying uh, reinforcement learning uh, to complex and increasingly higher stakes applications like self-driving cars, medical applications, robotics, um, control of our uh, energy infrastructure, um, science experiments, uh, and so on. But I would argue, and many of you probably agree, that a lot of the advances that we've seen in reinforcement learning have been in settings where we have a perfect computational model of the world. So the best example of this, of course, are games. So we know exactly how the Go board looks once we and our opponent have taken a move. And so exploration is primarily a computational uh, concern. And it's really amazing and remarkable how complex state spaces one can um, uh, now these days explore given enough computes and the representational power of deep neural networks. And of course, also uh, clever algorithmic advances. Uh, but uh, of course, in a lot of the domains, like those on the slide, where we might want to apply um, uh, reinforcement learning to, 
we often don't have accurate enough computational models of the world. That means if you really want to think about learning in this context, you'll have to somehow worry about where does the data come from. So efficiency and cost certainly comes to play in terms of acquiring the data. And then of course, if these are high stakes applications, then we better be very careful with what we do. Okay, so um, uh, what um, I basically mean by safe reinforcement learning is really this high level question of um, how can we think about agents efficiently learn to act safely in unknown uh, environments? And so what I'd like to tell you about is the research program that we've been following, um, which uh, as central components does careful uncertainty quantification. So we'll use probabilistic models that uh, quantify uncertainty in the predictions and then use this predictive uncertainty in conjunction with ideas from robust optimization, formal verification, um, game playing algorithms, uh, et cetera, in, uh, together with ideas from explicit safe exploration in order to come up with uh, algorithms that uh, achieve learning-based performance gains uh, while at the same time uh, satisfying, at least under some conditions, uh, certain, safety, certain safety guarantees. Okay, so then now be a bit more concrete. Of course, you have to drill down a little bit. So there's two uh, main paradigms in reinforcement learning, the model-based setting, where we seek to learn a model of the world, uh, environment and then uh, plan in it. And uh, of course, the model-free setup, where we maybe take a parametric family of policies, for example, given by neural network models, and then solve a global optimization problem where we optimize over the parameters um, uh, in order to maximize uh, the reward that we can uh, obtain. Okay, and so I'll actually start illustrating some of these ideas in this model-free setup, and then we'll come back to the model-based paradigm uh, later on in this talk. Okay, and so in particular, I want to talk about safe exploration for model-free reinforcement learning via safe Bayesian optimization. And as a motivating example, uh, so we are collaborating with the Paul Scherer Institute on using reinforcement learning in order to tune uh, their Swiss Fell free electron laser. Uh, so the Pochera Institute is a large federal research center uh, in Switzerland, and the Swiss Fell uh, free electron laser is a 700 meter long linear uh, accelerator, which generates hard X-ray pulses of extremely short duration. So femtosecond duration, one millionth of a billionth of a second. And with this machine, they can image extremely fast processes like molecules turning into each other in the context of say um, a chemical reaction, for example. And that of course has many applications from drug design to materials discovery, uh, and so on. It's also quite a complicated machine with many literally moving parts. Um, so in particular, the beam properties are shaped by various magnets deployed in this device, which can be uh, moved around and affect the responding uh, beam properties. And the properties of the beam also depend quite subtly on environmental conditions like temperature, humidity, and so on that fluctuate. So this machine continuously needs to be tuned and recalibrated. Now we also have to be careful with what we do. So talking about safety. So if you're not careful, then um, basically there can be beam losses, which might cause uh, some of the magnets of this laser to be demagnetized uh, and uh, require a replacement, right? And of course that's extremely expensive and we don't want to happen. Uh, so otherwise our algorithms will not run a second time on this machine. Okay, so uh, that means that we uh, basically now need to somehow optimize the performance uh, of this um, uh, electron laser under these safety constraints. So you can think about it um, uh, abstractly uh, in sort of this following um, uh, setting where we have a black box, maybe our uh, free electron laser, um, to which we can eject some experimental conditions, uh, some policy parameters. Um, we can then obtain a noisy measurement of um, our reward, say here the pulse energy that's being generated, perturbed by ceramine um, sub-Gaussian noise, um, and in addition, uh, we are going to get some measurements uh, that tell us how close we get to violating any of the safety constraints. So in this case, this is the readings, say, of the beam loss monitors on this device. Uh, okay, so the trouble is that we know neither F nor G uh, ahead of time. And also, uh, even though one can simulate to some extent the physics uh, in this machine, simulations are extremely expensive. And of course, if, uh, due to the subtle uh, influences of environmental conditions, um, uh, the uh, simulations will also not be perfectly accurate. So it means that we actually have to optimize the performance of the system based on measurements that we obtain. 
and close the loop by then uh, adapting the experiments that we want to carry out. And in the end, of course, we want to somehow solve this constraint optimization problem, optimizing, uh, say, beam performance subject to our constraints. But we not just want a feasible solution at the end, but want to guarantee feasibility every step along the way. OK, so we need to solve uh, an unconstrained, uh, non-convex um, optimization problem, uh, just given access uh, of basically a thorough order um, stochastic uh, observations. Um, while guaranteeing feasibility every step along the way. So it should be pretty obvious that in general, this is a completely opposed problem. So we because, can't make uh, any progress unless we make certain prior assumptions. Yes. A quick uh, question. Uh, could you explain how um, setting an, uh, an experimental condition like theta t leads to a any measurement of a constraint? Yeah, so basically um, theta t controls, say, the configuration of those magnets, right? And then we get the measurement of these beam loss monitors, right? So how uh, so basically, they monitor um, how much um, basically beam loss is happening. And as long as this doesn't create, reach certain critical thresholds, things are fine. So you can monitor in some sense how close we are to violating any of the constraints. So, but I thought the constraints were not known in advance. They constraint, so the, there's no analytic form of G of theta. So I, so I don't, or not even a, a, a simulation that we can efficiently use that is accurate enough, right? So we can't just um, invoke some computer code that would output g of theta uh, for a given value of theta. I see, I see. So the only way to evaluate these constraints is by conducting the experiments. I see, I see. OK, thank you. Okay. Good. So now one way of encoding prior assumptions uh, is to follow a Bayesian perspective. And that's exactly what's done in the field of Bayesian optimization. So we would endow our objective f and our constraint g with um, a particular uh, probabilistic model, a stochastic process. And uh, that allows us to then uh, quantify the uncertainty in the prediction um, and the outcome of experiments that we have not yet tried. And then, of course, we can use that predictive uncertainty in order to navigate the exploration exploitation dilemma. All right. So we basically treat the unknown function, uh, objective or constraint, as a draw from one of infinitely many possible sample paths of this probabilistic model. And then one can apply base rule in order to get a posterior distribution. Now, in principle, one can use many different Bayesian models here. Uh, so we'll uh, use quite a bit Gaussian processes uh, in this talk. Uh, they exhibit a nice sweet spot um, between um, a, a sort of expressiveness in terms of applications that they can capture, the ability of infusing prior knowledge into the models, uh, while at the same time being both computationally and mathematically uh, tractable. But later on, I'll also show you some experiments on using, say, Bayesian neural network models uh, and so on. OK, and so now for this Gaussian process prior, all the prior assumptions are effectively encoded via the choice of the covariance uh, function or kernel function uh, that models um, how, for given two uh, inputs theta and theta prime, the function uh, responds covariance. Now, why is this Bayesian model useful? So here's sort of a crucial picture. So suppose uh, we um, have carried out a bunch of experiments shown by those pluses here, and we've constructed our posterior prediction. Um, so a mean plus our uncertainty. And suppose the uncertainty is well calibrated in the sense that the true function shown in uh, the blue dashed line here is really contained in our posterior predictive intervals. Then we can apply the following rationale. So if you take a pessimistic estimate on our optimum, which is shown by this green dashed line here, uh, then the, um, uh, the locations of the optimum must be confined in this green region of plausible maximizers where the upper confidence bound exceeds this best uh, lower bound. And so this picture is often used as to motivate and justify the optimism in the face of uncertainty principle, which simply plays the point that maximizes the upper confidence bound, right? And in the case of Gaussian processes, that's just the GPU CD algorithm. Now, of course, if you also have safety constraints, then maybe being too optimistic is also not the right thing to do. Uh, but of course, one can apply the same rationale also to think about constraints. So now if, the, if this are the model of the constraints, this is our safety threshold, uh, then we could just simply restrict our exploration to this red subset of the domain, which is a conservative inner approximation of the safe set, of the feasible set, um, uh, that uh, is basically given uh, based on these confidence intervals. So this uh, basically statistically certifies safety. Now, of course, in order to use these pictures, a crucial question is whether we can actually come up with such well calibrated uh, confidence uh, intervals. And so, of course, um, if we are in the Bayesian settings, we have a well specified prior distribution and we care about uh, credible intervals at some point x, 
uh, then of course, this is just Gaussian. So you can just take our mean and add some multiple times the standard deviation to enumerate percentiles. But of course, in practice, you might not have a perfect prior knowledge about uh, the function, uh, so which might not actually uh, live in our credible intervals. Moreover, we want uh, this sort of, uh, uh, basically this sort of guarantee here, not just to hold at any point, but uniformly over the domain, right? So uh, in order to apply it algorithmically. Uh, but it turns out it's actually possible to rescale these confidence intervals in a way to guarantee basically uh, them to uniformly hold over the domain and over the steps of the algorithm, as well as even for settings where the true function can be adversarially chosen, possibly outside of the credible intervals. And the way we have to calibrate these confidence intervals basically depends on sort of the mismatch between nature and our model, which is captured by the reproducing kernel Hibbert space norm of the unknown function with respect to the uh, Bayesian prior and a notion of capacity, which quantifies sort of the um, maximum number of bits we can extract from this Gaussian process posterior using at most uh, T samples. And so this function gamma T is sort of a natural notion of complexity that will also show up in later algorithms and um, has some nice properties. So uh, uh, it turns out uh, due to some modularity of mutual information, one can numerically tractably get a constant factor approximation to this gamma T. So given any kernel function, any model, one can construct a numerical estimate uh, of this uh, parameter, and they can also get analytic up the, uh, upper bounds for certain types of covariance functions, like the Matern uh, covariance function, the Gaussian covariance, and so on. Okay, what matters, uh, so, uh, and there's also quite a bit of follow up work um, looking at um, basically uh, sort of heteroscedastic noise, heavier tailed noise, uh, sometimes even adversarially uh, chosen corruptions. Uh, so there's quite a bit of, uh, of work now exploring essentially these confidence forms. It means that at least under some conditions, we can establish uh, these, or we can sort of try to understand, then we can get well calibrated uh, confidence intervals and we can use them algorithmically. And one way to do so is given by the safe up algorithm. So as promised, um, we want to maximize F subject to a constraint on G. We're gonna use a Bayesian model for our objective and our constraint. And we maintain such a classification as described before. So we have our conservative uh, set uh, in red. And we also keep track of the set of plausible maximizers, which you can see in green here. Now, one natural strategy one might want to use is to just say, be optimistic in, on this red set here, right? So play say, the upper confidence strategy uh, on the set of plausible maximizers, but restrict it uh, to uh, actions that we can certify to be safe. The trouble with this is that this can lead to highly suboptimal solutions as uh, the set of plausible maximizers is often contained in the strict interior of this uh, red set and there's no incentive to explore the boundary. One has to think a little bit more carefully about what exploration means in the safety critical setting. And one way to fix this issue is to also consider this purple set of uh, plausible expanders. So these are sets of points that plausibly allow us to infer additional actions as safe. And so now here among those, you basically pick the most informative um, action that is either expansive or plausibly optimal. And eventually we'll figure out that it's actually better solutions in this part of the domain. Okay, so that's the high level idea. And under the um, regularity assumptions as described before, so basically under the condition that these confidence bounds are well calibrated, one can guarantee both safety and completeness about the resulting algorithm. So with arbitrarily high a priori specified probability over the noise realization, one can guarantee that the algorithm will never pick an unfeasible point along the way, and one can bound the number of samples needed in order to find an epsilon optimal solution. If we really ask for global optimality, uh, then even under smooth kernels like the Gaussian kernel, of course, there's terms that are exponential in the dimension, but if you are interested in local notions of optimality, one can get away with polynomial dependence in the dimension. Okay, so this is the basic algorithm. There's also been quite some follow-up work. So we had a paper at NeurIPS last year on the following idea. So, so SafeUp, one of its shortcomings is that it tends to explore the boundary too much. So it really tries to push uh, the safe set as much as possible. And uh, in settings where we care about the cumulative regret, it can actually uh, suffer a lot of cumulative regret. Uh, so one possible remedy um, of this uh, is proposed in this uh, NURBS paper last year, uh, which does this expansion in a goal-oriented fashion. So here the idea works as follows. So we are going to use an arbitrary acquisition function like uh, the GPU-CD algorithm or some other acquisition function like max value entropy search, for example, that proposes a new point that we'd like to explore. Um, if we can certify it to be safe, we just play it. Um, if we can't, we sort of plan a path towards it. That's sort of the high level idea. So we expand our safe set in that direction. 
Okay, so uh, uh, now let me just show you some results on this uh, Swiss file um, uh, uh, application that I uh, mentioned uh, to you earlier. And so here, um, uh, two of my students, Johannes and Moimir, actually went ahead and uh, deployed um, a variant of the algorithm live on the machine um, to tune 24 uh, parameters of the uh, system online. So the sort of experiments that they would carry out is as follows. So they would start with parameter settings chosen by the domain experts, by the physicists. They would then adversarially detune them and uh, use different algorithms to try to recover uh, good parameter settings. And so not only does the algorithm not violate any constraints along the way, it also finds better solutions than sort of the standard local search techniques that are used uh, in, this, uh, in this domain. And in many cases actually finds parameter settings that, are, that outperform those uh, uh, that were originally proposed by the, by the domain experts. There's also been uh, quite some other work on um, applications of variants of the safe opt algorithm. So one, um, a paper I'd like to point out is some really nice work by Jan and Sui, who was one of the co-authors of the uh, of the Safe Opt uh, paper um, with his collaborators in the Robotics uh, group and also Yu Song Yu at, at Caltech. Um, uh, and they basically used the variant of the algorithm called Stage Opt uh, in a medical application where they optimized over stimulus patterns applied to spinal cord uh, injured patients. So they worked with uh, patients. Um, that uh, have, say, uh, suffered an accident and have no control over their lower limbs anymore. They implant them these electrode arrays that you can see on this X-ray image, and then they use the algorithm in order to optimize over stimuli patterns in order to maximize therapeutic effectiveness. So I, I very much encourage you to take a look at, uh, at this paper. And then there's some other work, um, for example, using the algorithm to tune uh, um, uh, um, uh, control parameters, for example, for PID controllers in a context-specific fashion with applications to building energy management uh, and so on. So this is what I wanted to say about the model free setting. So one um, implicit assumption that we've been making is that we can basically repeat the same experiment over and over again, the so-called episodic setting. Uh, but of course, if you really want to think about deploying, deploying um, RL agents in real world environments, we might not be able to just uh, basically safely reset uh, them to a given starting state. And we have to worry about uh, long-term uh, safety properties. And I think one of the real only ways to get at this is to actually dive a bit deeper and actually try to model the underlying dynamics. So I want to talk a little bit about some ideas in this uh, direction. In particular, how one can use these um, uh, learning-based uh, confidence intervals as described before, um, in the context of uh, robust model predictive control as well as, well as ideas from formal verification. Uh, so now, as you said, we go to the model-based setup. So we need to learn a model. And so basically we now consider nonlinear dynamical systems that map states and actions to next states. Um, so here, uh, we again typically need to inform, infuse some sort of prior knowledge. So one natural way to do that is to assume that this dynamics model has a known a priori, say first principles component, uh, maybe given a physics model of the, uh, of, the, um, of the system or learned from lots of prior data. And then there is some um, disturbance that is unknown that models discrepancies between this a priori model and how nature behaves. And this is what we uh, then learn with the probabilistic model. And uh, in particular, I'll talk about the case of Gaussian processes here, which is a setting that's been uh, looked at quite a bit in Gaussian process dynamics models um, and uh, various algorithms of that kind. So now this sort of setting is quite natural in settings where um, maybe you think about some surreal transfer. So you have maybe some first principle model uh, in simulation, but then uh, um, you care about deploying it on some real environment, but also even in settings, for example, where you control, control flying robots, uh, maybe you have a first principles model that works very accurately um, if the robot is hovering in the air, um, but uh, fails to uh, capture, say, ground effects when it hovers close to the, uh, close to the ground. And the sort of uh, decomposition allows you to then model systematic deviations from this first principle model. Okay, so I'll illustrate everything in terms of this uh, RL101 stylized task, the cart pole, right, that's supposed to reach some target, preferably without the pole falling to the ground. As you said, we want to use our confidence bounds. Um, so one cartoon to maybe think about it is we now have our state space. We have a subset of states that we want to avoid, maybe the card pole falling to the ground. Um, so what we want to do is we want to plan ahead 
maybe multiple time steps in sort of a receding horizon fashion uh, and try to ensure that for all plausible dynamics, nothing bad happens. Uh, and this is, of course, where, in principle, we can use uh, these predictive confidence bounds in order to forecast uh, plausible uh, dynamics. Now, um, given that we sort of roam around, collect more and more data, we become more and more confident about the resulting dynamics. Hence, the confidence bounds shrink, enabling less and less conservative uh, behavior and more performant behavior uh, subsequently. Um, okay, so uh, now that means that one of the challenges, if you want to use these ideas, is to really uh, think about how to forward propagate these un, uh, uncertain nonlinear dynamics. And so uh, since we uh, say use Gaussian process models, the one step ahead predictions, they're very nice and simple. They're just ellipses, right? They're just Gaussians. But if we even just iterate one step forward through the nonlinear dynamics, of course, uh, these ellipses get distorted in a pretty nasty fashion. Okay, and if you want to think about safety, we want to have some sort of over approximation. And so one question that we asked and looked at in a recent CDC paper is basically how to use these um, conservative one step confidence intervals of the kind described to you earlier in this talk uh, and construct some um, uh, provably conservative uh, over approximation in terms of um, ellipses and Gaussians that uh, are guaranteed uh, to be valid uh, with high probability. And so if uh, this can be done computationally efficiently, and moreover, uh, in situations uh, where you also have, say, some local linear feedback control, you can actually get fairly uh, uh, tight uh, approximations, at least for predicting a few steps uh, into the future. The trouble is that uh, even if we can predict a few time steps into the future, safety is typically really a property over very long horizons. Here's sort of the cartoon in our inverted uh, in our card poll example, right? So uh, if a state is safe as long as the uh, pole hasn't fallen to the ground, all of those states here would be safe. Um, however, uh, for those last two states here, no matter given limitations on the force we can apply, you will not be able uh, to put the uh, pole in the upright position again. So we are bound to eventually crash to the ground. Okay, so if we only plan say two time steps to be concrete ahead of time, right? Then, of course, um, we would conclude that uh, going to this transition is safe, right? Because one step ahead, uh, doesn't, uh, nothing bad will happen, or two time steps ahead from here. Uh, but then, of course, once we reach the state, we can't return. So we really have to think about um, uh, goodicity, reachability, long-term uh, properties. And there's various different ways of how to do that. I want to show you one way uh, where one can probably do this using um, <clears throat> these confidence intervals that I've described uh, to you before, in particular for the special case of stability verification, which of course is a crucial notion in the context of nonlinear dynamical systems. And of course, the crucial notion for stability certification are Yapunov functions. Um, uh, so uh, uh, just a quick uh, reminder. So if this is our uh, one dimensional state space in this cartoon here, uh, this is our dynamics. Um, what we'll assume is we'll assume some sort of safe starting point, so some initial policy pi, uh, together with some initial uh, safe set of states that you can see here, under which we know that you can safely apply uh, this policy. Now, so as we said, we need to have some sort of prior assumptions, otherwise safe exploration is completely uh, impossible, and this is the way to uh, encode such, uh, such prior um, assumptions. So if you think about the carpool example, this prior might just say that if, the pole is upright and the car pole is still, we know how to keep it stable, okay? But it doesn't tell us anything about how we can say, move the car pole to a given uh, target destination. Now, Lyapunov function, of course, is just a positive definite uh, function. And uh, the key idea is to now certify regions of attraction using uh, Lyapunov analysis. So basically we're going to look for sub level sets of this Lyapunov function um, in which we can guarantee that um, the system dynamics F together with this policy pi, so the cl closed loop dynamics, will take us downhill in terms of this Lyapunov function. If we can certify this, then from the one step property, right, this is just a one step transition, we can verify long term safety properties that eventually we'll get back to this, uh, uh, this uh, control invariant set. Now, of course, the trouble is uh, if you don't know our unknown function, uh, then it's not clear how to apply this. Uh, but what one can do um, is if we use these confidence intervals on the dynamics, what we can basically try to do is we can try to uh, verify this uh, Lyapunov decrease condition for all plausible uh, dynamics, 
All right, uh, and if we can do this, then we can guarantee with high probability all plausible dynamics um, will be taken sort of downhill, at least with this uh, policy pi. Now, of course, uh, the question is, uh, in the end, we want to do planning. We want to improve on this policy pi. And in this NERPS paper here, we also describe ways of how one can then go ahead and actually improve uh, on the policies themselves and even uh, use ideas um, uh, of uh, optimizing the Lyapunov function itself uh, in a data-driven fashion. That's nice ways actually, of, for example, using neural networks to uh, parameterize positive definite functions, which can be used as Lyapunov candidates here. Okay, so now then can put all of these ideas uh, together. Uh, so you can think about sort of a model predictive control fashion where we basically plan two strategies in parallel, plan A and plan B. Uh, so plan B is our fallback strategy, a safety trajectory, which is guaranteed under all plausible dynamics to take us back uh, to this um, uh, to this um, uh, to the safe set. While at the same time we plan plan A, right, the performance trajectory, which aims to trade exploration and exploitation um, in order to maximize uh, performance. And by tying them together to the first action, as long as these confidence bounds are well calibrated, we can rest assured that with high probability, we'll in the worst case be able to follow the safety trajectory. Otherwise, we'll be able to go and uh, try to solve our task. Okay, and so um, then under the same sort of regularity conditions that I've described before, one can guarantee um, basically that we'll always be able to return to the safe set um, and hence uh, satisfy this long-term um, safety property as well. So here's some illustrations on this uh, card pool um, examples. We compare against some prior work which uses Gaussian processes for mo uh, constrained model predictive uh, control motivated by similar uh, considerations. Uh, so this prior work um, uses chance constraints uh, in order to ensure multiple step ahead uh, uh, feasibility. Um, but doesn't verify long-term safety properties of the followed strategy. And as a consequence, while it's able to very quickly learn an, a, a very good policy, basically, and very quickly uh, avoids failures, uh, at least to a large extent, at least initially, since it doesn't take into account long-term safety properties, uh, it does suffer from a number of failures. In contrast, uh, the method that I just described um, uh, has higher cost so it takes a little longer to find a good policy. Uh, still does this uh, does, does so quite quickly after about 15 uh, episodes here, um, but uh, doesn't suffer from any failure along the way because it does take into account these uh, terminal set constraints. Good, so um, now this is of course a very uh, simple uh, sort of uh, setting that we've described before, right? This card poll example. Uh, and our key question of course is how to scale up. And this is something that we're very actively exploring and working on. And I'd like to tell you about some idea, uh, some ideas uh, in really scaling up these confidence-based exploration techniques uh, to much um, higher dimensional state spaces, much more complex uh, systems. And for that, for now, let's maybe put safety as a side and just uh, focus on sample efficiency and efficiency in exploration. In particular, I want to tell you about um, uh, a new approach to implement optimism in uh, model-based uh, deep reinforcement learning. And so, as I mentioned before, uh, optimism in the face of uncertainty is a, a really classical principle in bandits, reinforcement learning, uh, and so on, uh, backed up uh, by strong theory, uh, regret bounds, and so on. Uh, however, so far has been very hard uh, to really make work in uh, model-based reinforcement learning settings. And one of the key challenges really is if you want to basically do optimistic um, exploration, you jointly have to optimize over policies, pi, but at the same time optimizing over all plausible dynamics. So your MT is just a set of plausible models uh, that are supported by the data from the first uh, T experiences. And this is really a very difficult optimization problem and we haven't uh, basically, it's, it's very hard to solve in practice. So instead, the state-of-the-art algorithms that use probabilistic models in model-based deep reinforcement learning, uh, they explore just greedily. So they keep track of an expectation um, over possible dynamics and then basically maximize the, uh, greedily maximize the expected performance where you take the expectation with respect to the posterior distribution of a dynamics from after the first T samples. 
And so in the case of Gaussian process dynamics, that's just the Pilko method, in the case of Bayesian neural network ensembles, that's the PETS algorithm, uh, and so on. So this is a really widely used idea. And the advance is that because we deal with expectations here, we can use ideas from stochastic optimization policy search in order to really come up with efficient algorithms for solving that kind of problem. So what we have um, discovered and uh, presenting in the NURBS paper coming up uh, this conference um, is basically a new uh, idea of implementing optimism in model-based uh, deep reinforcement learning, um, which basically makes use of a reduction. And the key idea is to reduce uh, the problem of optimistic optimization and deep reinforcement learning to just optimize, to just the standard uh, policy search problem uh, for which very efficient algorithms um, are available. And so in the context of Gaussian process dynamics, this actually still allows us to develop sublinear regret bounds, uh, but one can now plug in very naturally, say, Bayesian neural network models, neural network ensembles uh, to really scale uh, to large data and uh, high dimensional uh, state domains. So here I want to describe kind of the key idea uh, behind uh, the algorithm. Um, so uh, this is, of course, a really stylized cartoon. So you start in the starting state. The state space uh, is the, the y-axis here. We want to reach um, basically uh, the sparse uh, reward state. That's our goal state. Uh, so what we do is we, uh, of course, have to in the end optimize over policy, right? Mapping states uh, to actions. Uh, but of course, there's uncertainty in our prediction, which is captured by a Bayesian dynamics model. So think about um, the Gaussian process dynamics that we've uh, described uh, to you before. And here we will crucially only make use of one step ahead predictions, which you can uh, quite accurately model, uh, say, with Gaussian processes, now also Bayesian neural network models. Now, the key issue in uh, optimistic exploration is now we would have to optimize um, over all plausible dynamics. Instead, we are going to do something else. So instead, we are going to optimize our luck. Okay, so we introduce an additional set of decision variables captured by another policy, eta which basically tells us for any given state um, where in these one-step confidence intervals we are going to end up, okay? Uh, so uh, we basically hallucinate um, additional uh, control authority uh, over the outcome uh, of the epistemic uncertainty of our model. And in turn, this basically implements an optimistic trajectory as shown in this green dashed line here. Now, unrolling for some further time step, we just again run our policy, have these ones that had predictions, and again ask our luck that we optimize right where in these confidence bounds we end up with. And this way, we keep constructing basically this optimistic trajectory, which in this case actually is able to find a way towards the sparse reward. Um, and in the end, uh, we basically just, in terms of the structure, uh, just have a standard policy search problem where we have just the larger action space, right? So our action space is not just the action of the policy, but also um, the, uh, the realization of our luck, right? Where we end up in, in terms of uh, the model uncertainty, right? But as a consequence, one can use uh, standard policy search algorithms uh, to optimize the resulting uh, optimization problem very efficiently. And crucially, the algorithm never really requires accurate multi-step ahead predictions, long-term uh, predictions of uh, the model uncertainty, which is really hard to get for, for complicated high dimensional models. So here's uh, a, a cartoon illustration of these, how these trajectories look like for an inverted pendulum task. Um, so uh, there's basically uh, the angle and the angular velocity. The right plot here shows the optimistic trajectory that our model hallucinates um, where it gets to control the outcome of the luck. Um, and so basically, uh, uh, initially, it thinks it really has strong control over the pendulum and can immediately drive it to the upright position. When it tries it out uh, in the real world, it gets disappointed because it can't actually exert this control, but it collects some data along the way, refines its estimate, and now it figures out that it actually has to swing back a little bit in order to reach the top position. And when deployed on the real, uh, on the real system, basically, it uh, collects uh, um, data over larger parts of the state space, and uh, as you proceed after five episodes already, uh, it has learned to reach the upright position, but it overshoots a little bit. And after two more episodes, it basically found, um, uh, found an optimal policy. Okay, so this is a very simple setting, but now you can really scale this to more complex tasks like the Mujoko benchmark suite that we reported in the NURBS paper. And so here's some experiments on the Mujoko task. Um, so uh, on the, uh, the half cheetah uh, uh, task in the, uh, in the Mujoko simulator, x is the number of episodes, the y-axis is the return obtained. The uh, red line is the greedy policy. So what we use is we use a Bayesian 
um, and an ensemble of neural network models to capture the epistemic uncertainty in our model. And here we see um, basically uh, now what, what the greedy method does, as discussed before, it basically optimizes the expected performance uh, in expectation over the ensemble members. One natural strategy uh, that can also be used, of course, is Thompson sampling or posterior sampling. So what we could do is we could just draw a model from our posterior and optimize it. Uh, that um, uh, it does indeed a bit better uh, in the end. Um, but this optimistic strategy I described to you before actually performs uh, quite a bit better already in this setting. Now, this is still a fairly simple exploration task, and we can look at harder exploration tasks. And one way to control the difficulty of exploration uh, in these environments is to uh, in, uh, introduce action penalties. So you can basically uh, penalize controls uh, that use a lot of force, right? That apply high torque to the joints, um, which of course you might want to do in many uh, different applications, um, uh, but this makes exploration harder because uh, it basically uh, penalizes uh, random exploration, right? It quickly encourages uh, the found policies to be close to the starting state. And now in, as you increase these action penalties quite a bit, um, the standard exploration techniques, including posterior sampling, uh, fail really quite badly, versus this optimistic exploration can still find very good policies. Right, and so just to give you a little bit of intuition, so if these small action penalties, then basically you let the robot do anything, right? It can really apply as much force as possible, leading to quite uh, unrealistic uh, behaviors. And with larger action penalties, you, aggress uh, you avoid overly aggressive controls. Uh, and uh, that makes the exploration harder, uh, but using more informed exploration strategies, you can still actually find good policies. Uh, so how are we doing in time? Um, so I have a couple more slides that I'm happy to uh, show, but we can also, uh, can also slowly uh, wrap up. So we have um, maybe five more minutes and then, then that will leave minutes. some time for questions. Okay, sounds good. So I maybe just quickly get a sense of this. So this is um, some work that also makes use of uh, confidence intervals uh, for um, Gaussian process models in order to improve the efficiency of multi-agent learning. Uh, so I'd like to at least show that slide. So this is a slide that I showed uh, at an ITAM workshop earlier this year, and I want to bring it back because it sort of brings back these fond memories when travel was still possible. Uh, so hopefully next time I'll actually be able to uh, visit MIT in person and I'll have a slide of Boston there. Okay, so given that I was at ITAM, of course, I had to figure out how to go to the beach um, every day. And so if you ask Google Maps, uh, it will tell you basically different paths you can take. Of course, the trouble is I'm not the only one who wants to go to the beach. There's many others. And uh, how quickly I can get there depends on what all the other agents are doing as well. Okay, so that means that in the end, there are some amount of competition through congestion and these different broad segments, obviously. And now one natural notion of performance to look at there uh, is of course the notion of regrets, right? Comparing the best we could have done in hindsight for a given set of action profiles played by the other players minus uh, the reward that we got, um, right? How quickly we were able to, uh, to, get, uh, to get to the beach. Of course, um, sort of learning to play these games is a super well-studied problem. Um, and how well you can do depends on what kind of observations you can get, what kind of feedback you can get. So of course there's the bandit setting where you only get to see how long it took you on the path that you took uh, to the beach. Uh, and uh, the difficulty with this bandit feedback is that because you have limited information, uh, you have a poor scaling in terms of the number of choices you have, right? If you scale like square root K, the K is the number of actions. In contrast, uh, in, in, uh, there's the full information online learning setting um, where uh, you can get an exponential improvement in terms of the number of actions. However, you need this counterfactual feedback, right? You need to know in hindsight how fast you would have been able um, to get to the beach had you taken any different route. And in many applications, this can actually be uh, quite difficult uh, to get. And so what we've been exploring in this uh, NERDS paper um, is basically uh, a model that's sort of in between um, so we look at the feedback model that's just a bit richer than the bandit feedback. So we assume we get bandit feedback, but we also get in hindsight information about the other the actions that the other players played, but not how long it say, would have taken us had we taken any other route. Um, and under some conditions, this allows to basically get close to full information rates uh, at this much weaker form of uh, feedback. And, into, and actually um, uh, for this result to hold, Oftentimes you don't need to know precisely what every agent did, uh, but just some sort of aggregate feedback is enough. 
And so now how to do this? Well, we can use the confidence bounds. We basically model the payoff function of the game uh, with the Gaussian process or an RKHS function that allows us to construct these confidence bounds described uh, before. And these confidence bounds we can then use to hallucinate the counterfactual feedback, right? To hallucinate how much it could have, how much faster we could have been had we taken uh, a different action, uh, a different path to go to the fish. Okay, and so here's just some simulation experiments on a routing uh, task uh, where, uh, of course, um, there's the full information ceiling performance that's, uh, that you can't beat. Uh, there's the bandit setting. Um, if you just do uh, standard Q-learning, it really converges very slowly for that sort of setting. Um, but basically, the hallucinated full information feedback uh, ends up somewhere between the spectrum. And also in terms of the congestion of the overall network, you can do get much closer to the full information feedback, even you have uh, much, even though you have much less information. And there's a number of extensions to this. So you can also look at con context, for example, uh, like taking into account the weather. Of course, uh, maybe in Los Angeles it's always sunny, uh, but that might not be the case everywhere. Um, you can also think about sequential games where other actions, uh, other players play after you, uh, and so on, and use these ideas um, of establishing confidence on other players' actions. So that's basically it. Uh, so there's many exciting open problems still left if you want to bring RL closer to real world applications. I told you about some idea um, where it's really these confidence bounds are a crucial vehicle that combined with ideas from formal verification and robust optimization and ideas from robust uh, so from safe exploration allow to obtain learning-based performance gains while at the same time satisfying safety guarantees. Many interesting questions, how to really rigorously address partial observability, um, uh, address distribution shifts and so on. So one last one I just want to say a word on is of course, is where do these models come from, right? Because that in many of these applications is really one of the biggest challenges, right? Coming up with these well calibrated uh, confidence intervals. And uh, for this purpose, we've been exploring ideas uh, from meta learning, right? So basically ideas uh, from trying to learn good prior distributions from multiple uh, related tasks. So for example, in the Swiss file application, one can very naturally get from lots of experiments that they collect historical data about how different tuning parameters work in different environmental conditions and so on, and use this in order to learn good um, prior distributions. And we've been uh, looking at ways of how to use uh, PEC Bayesian analyses um, in order to learn uh, good priors. In this case, learn say um, mean and covariance functions parameterized by neural networks. And the resulting um, uh, models not only yield good predictive performance, but in particular improve substantially in terms of model calibration, which is really crucial uh, for, for the tasks that I've described to you before. So here's a few references just for completeness if you want to learn more. There's also a tutorial I gave at Coral uh, just a few days ago um, uh, that is uh, online, I think. And with that, I'd like to conclude thanking all the collaborators, the PhD students, postdocs, uh, as well as my senior uh, collaborators. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. It was very packed full of results. Um, so while uh, so now we welcome anyone to ask questions. Feel free to ask questions in the chat if you're more comfortable, but also feel free to, uh, I don't know, raise your hand or just unmute yourself uh, in the remaining uh, seven minutes that we have. And while uh, everyone is thinking about their questions, I have um, uh, one to, to get us started. Um, so, uh, yeah, for those of us uh, in the in the audience who haven't worked as much with um, with GPS and Bayesian neural networks, I was wondering if you could give us some rules of thumb that uh, help uh, help us decide when to use one versus the other. What is sort of the threshold, uh, or what what you know what kinds of problems would you want to use uh, one versus the other? I think this is very much out there. I mean, so of course. Um, uh, so, so uh, it depends on how much prior information you have versus how much prior data you have, right? So I mean, certainly one major advantage of Bayesian neural network models is that uh, they scale a lot better, at least out of the box with massive data sets and can learn representations given large data sets, right? So that is an advantage. Um, of course, with GPs, just out of the box, the scaling is harder, right? So if you just implement them naively, of course, you have this cubic scaling. Of course, there's lots of work on how to scale up um, uh, GP inference uh, and so on, right? And in the end, um, uh, if you use sort of all the approximations out there, the methods you end up with in both cases don't actually look that different anymore. Okay, so I think it's really sort of a blurry boundary, right? If you really want to uh, say uh, in, in the situation where you have very little sampled data, uh, 
um, really the only way to go forward is by using substantial domain knowledge. And of course, that's something that GPs let you do very naturally. Um, the questions. All right. So, uh, all right. So we have one question in the chat. Could you talk a little bit more about the information needed from other agents in the, uh, the routing example? Mm -hmm. Must the other agents uh, have the same start and start point slash end destination? Let me bring back. Um, that slide. Uh, maybe this one, right? So, so here's basically uh, the setup that we consider. So we consider playing a repeated game um, where there's a fixed payoff function. So there's some function f, which depends on the complete action profile. So the action we took and the action that all the other players took. We assume that f remains constant. Of course, uh, we don't assume that what the other players do remains constant. Okay, so, uh, uh, and then basically what we assume is that we get to see uh, f evaluated at this full action profile perturbed with some sub Gaussian noise. Okay, and so now essentially what the method does is try to construct confidence bounds on this function f and uses those in order to hallucinate this full information feedback. But here we haven't made any assumptions, we haven't made anything about assumptions on what uh, the different, uh, which actions the different players are taking and so on, right? So in this routing game, um, they can start from an arbitrary starting point and, uh, and so on. Okay, so basically all the structure is encoded uh, through, this, uh, through this function f. As I briefly mentioned, one can also extend this now to the contextual setting where this function f not just depends on the action profile, right? So what the players do, but also say some exogenous context variable, maybe the weather uh, or some other uh, conditions that you can measure. Um, and that is revealed to all the agents before uh, they take uh, their decision. And then one can basically build this joint model now as a function of uh, the, uh, the, the actions and that context variable, okay? And so basically um, how sort of the feedback model comes in uh, is basically that um, uh, since you basically use this prior assumption um, on F, right? Uh, you uh, can basically, and you, the actions of the players are revealed to you, you essentially get a point observation of this function F, uh, which you can use to construct these confidence estimates. Great, and now we have a question from Stuart uh, Jameson. I'm gonna ask him to unmute to ask this question. Hi, yeah, thanks for your talk. Uh, I was curious about in the safe opt uh, algorithm, mm -hmm. it seems like mm -hmm. finding the uh, optimum, or well, at least a global optimum would depend on some kind of connectedness or like bridges between the region where you start and then uh, other regions with potentially better optima. Uh, so I was curious about if in the cases of things like drones or uh, problems that you've studied, is there, do you have any theorems or observations about like the connectedness of these safe uh, or of the yeah. safe space, or uh, is it a great, great, uh, great question, great observation. Um, I skipped over this a bit uh, quickly. So the guarantee here, right, is this uh, is with respect to the reachable point, which is basically uh, the global optimum um, on within the connected component that contains your starting point. Um, and so now, of course, in principle, this can be arbitrarily worse, right? Then, um, uh, then uh, the global optimum uh, somewhere, right? So uh, now, of course, one point is maybe global optimality is in high dimensional domains anyways, too much to ask for. Uh, of course, that's one other comment. Uh, but the other comment is um, uh, in order to say more about how well basically this reachable optimal point compares to the globally optimal point, uh, that requires, um, I mean, a, a lot of more insights on specific applications. So on the ones that we looked at, so we did some experiments uh, on drones, but also in the context of this, um, uh, safe opt, uh, so the, the the laser and so on, right? Um, of course, we don't know what really is the ground truth, right? I mean, the only thing we can say is we can look at how, how good was the performance that we uh, were able to get in the end. Maybe one thing I should point out though is that of course, under some further um, assumptions, for example, if you know that the constraints are convex or so, right? Then obviously um, uh, uh, one can guarantee that uh, the uh, the safe set is actually, uh, so, so, you, so you'll actually uh, be able to find the global uh, global optimum. Uh, maybe just one quick follow-up on that. 
yeah. in a simpler case where, for example, you had a drone and maybe you did the safe opt, but then you like attached a weight to it or something. Uh, do you mm -hmm. have any insights on how like these types of minor variations in like parameter setup could affect the safe space or anything else about yeah. this type of optimization? So maybe the question that you're asking sort of more generally is, so what happens if you also have discrete components and so on, right? So if smoothness is not there anymore, right? Right, and yeah, so that would be. I think that's, yeah. So, I mean, that, that is definitely a, a very uh, interesting question, right? And so a lot of what we talked about relies on being able to somehow assess on how close you get uh, to the boundary, right? To be, be able to diagnose how close do you get to a constraint violation. And of course, that can be challenging to do in a discrete set. Now, one, of course, general comment is uh, GPs are well-defined for discrete spaces as well, right? And they're specialized kernels, right? For things like graphs and uh, other things, right? And of course, one can also construct kernels for um, basically uh, mixed discrete continuous uh, decision spaces. And we have some work uh, on that um, as well, right? So that now goes very much into sort of how to model these uh, domains and so on, right? Coupled with safety, of course, now, um, to some extent, it might still allow you to make some progress, right? If you can sort of predict, say, the constraint associated with um, even discrete configurations you haven't uh, tried yet, it might be possible to, possible to make some assessments about um, how likely they are to satisfy the constraints. Uh, but again, this is uh, just a, a very general question, and one would have to look more specifically at uh, different applications. Now, for the drone with the weight, um, I'm uh, I'm not so sure. I think if you know, um, basically, if you tell the algorithm that you add a weight, uh, you can basically view this as sort of a contextual version of the algorithm. So you can basically sort of add um, a, a separate variable that describes the context, maybe the fact that you added the weight or maybe the weights that you added to the drone. And I think it should be possible to still do something in that case. Uh, but otherwise, I suspect um, uh, things might get more problematic. Um, so as I mentioned, we looked a little bit at what happens if you have um, uh, a possibly even adversarial corruptions. So there's, to some extent, one can even deal with sort of non-stochastic uh, adversarial corruptions, um, but uh, in general, really pushing the limit on how far you can get also in terms of safety guarantees is an open question. Thank you. Okay, unfortunately, we are at the top of the hour. Um, Andreas, thank you for, uh, please join me everyone in thanking Andreas for an amazing talk. And we do actually have a couple uh, additional questions for you, Andreas, and uh, at least some of these folks can stay for uh, on for uh, some more time. So for everyone, again, this is the end of the session, so feel free to sign off. For anyone who's interested in or has more questions, we're going to keep the room open until uh, 1215 or so Boston time for anyone with uh, with more questions. So thank you, Andreas, for a wonderful talk. Sure. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, Kathy, for hosting me. And I'm happy, as I said, to uh, stick around for, uh, for some more time.